Everybody, welcome back. How's the day going? You having fun? Good? You must be exhausted, especially East Coasters. Definitely tired, right? Well, I hope, you're, I hope you're having an inspiring day, an exciting day, and most of all, I hope you're all staying very curious. Um, before I introduce uh, this afternoon's keynote speaker, I just want to give you a little reminder that immediately after this, you can head downstairs to level one to the marketing expo. We're going to have a reception there, cocktails, a little bit of food, a little bit of networking. Should be a lot of fun. So uh, definitely come on down um, after, after this uh, keynote address. Um, back to the keynote itself. So we talked a lot about influence. And you, know, you guys probably all wonder, you know, how come some things catch on? Some things go viral. And other things just never really take off. Um, some things stay on and, and become popular, and other things just never really take off. Um, how do you generate more word of mouth around your brand or your product? Well, Jonah Berger has the answers. Um, he's a marketing professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's the author of the recent New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Dr. Berger has spent the last decade studying how social influence works and how it drives products and ideas to catch on. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Jonah Berger. So everyone here today has a very similar goal, and that is how can we help our organizations be more successful? How can we help our products and our ideas catch on? How can we help our brands grow? How can we get more customers and influence folks with inside our organization? And today I'm going to talk about the science of how to do that. We'll talk about how to be more influential and how we can use influence to get our stuff to catch on. But before we get there, I want to start in a very different place. And that is with a quick game. I know it's been a wonderful day. It's been a great day of talks and information. I know particularly folks from the East Coast might be a little tired, and so I want to wake us up a little bit by playing a quick game. It's a game you've never played before, but I promise you'll get the hang of it very quickly. It's called Which is Tastier? I'm going to put up two things on the screen, and I'm going to ask you which of them is tastier. And importantly, I want you to be honest. Not what you wish was tastier, not what you think should be tastier, but which of the two things on the screen is actually tastier? I promise you'll get the hang of this quite quickly, OK? Our first contestant is a wonderful, delicious head of broccoli. Now, you're probably aware that broccoli has a lot of vitamins and nutrients. You're probably aware that broccoli has a lot of fiber. You may not have realized that broccoli has a lot of vitamin C, but it does. So if you're sick, if you have a cold, and you're thinking about a tall glass of orange juice, think about a tall stalk of broccoli instead. Uh, but that's contestant number one. And contestant number two is a cheeseburger. Now, this is not my version of a cheeseburger. If I was going to eat a cheeseburger, I would certainly have bacon on top. Some very unscientific research done by me over a number of years suggests that basically everything is better with bacon on top. So I would certainly put bacon on the cheeseburger. I'd grill the onions. I'd probably keep the pickles. I might switch out the American cheese for blue cheese. But feel free to put whatever toppings you like on the cheeseburger. And to be even, to keep things fair, feel free to put whatever toppings you like on the broccoli as well. OK, here's the tough part. We have to vote. Ready? Which is tastier? How many would go with the cheeseburger? OK, most everybody. Uh, and how many go with the broccoli? Oh, a sizable mi minority. Good. Are you guys vegetarians? I heard some yeses. I also heard some noes. Are, are you guys liars? <laughs> maybe you're a pescatarian. Maybe you're a vegan. I I'll let your colleagues guess based on how well they know you. But the point here is really simple. We all know what we should do. Right? We should eat more fruits and vegetables. Organizations have spent decades of time, and at this point, billions of dollars, trying to convince people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And yet, when push comes to shove, people don't do it. When it's late at night, when we're tired, when we're on the road, the cheeseburger beckons. And it's not random or luck how it works. It fits better with the way our tongues and our stomachs are designed. Very simply, certain food is tastier than others. I don't know if you've been to McDonald's recently, but they spent millions of dollars engineering french fries. So the amount of crisp and salt and sugar, they hit your tongue, your tongue just lights up. 
right? Certain food is tastier than others. Some of you are like waiting for dinner. Your stomach is rumbling like, will you please stop talking about food? Well, I am. I'm going to take this analogy of certain food being tastier than others, and I'm going to port it to a slightly different domain, which is how tasty is the way we communicate, whether externally to our customers and clients or internally to the bosses and employees that we manage within our organizations, how tasty is the way we communicate? Because just like certain food is tastier, based on the way it fits with our tongue and our stomach, certain ideas, certain messages, certain ways of communicating information are going to be more effective based on the way they fit with people's minds. If we understand the science behind word of mouth, behind social transmission, behind how influence works, we can craft contagious content, we can build more effective messages, we can get our stuff to catch on, and we can be more influential. And so I'll talk about a few things today. First, I'll talk about how we can make our communications tastier by understanding the science of influence and the science of why people talk and share. Second, how can we better understand our prospects and customers? How can we understand the underlying behavioral science that drives what people do? Whether those people are customers or clients or people within our organizations. And then third, how can we help our stuff catch on? Whether those are products or ideas or services to our external customers or to our internal stakeholders. But before we get there, one more question for me. Here are three products or brands that all of you are probably quite familiar with, or at least a few of them. How many of you have heard of Walt Disney World? Yeah, good. Self-described place where dreams come true. Everybody knows Disney World. Honey Nut Cheerios? At least most of you. Wonderful, delicious breakfast cereal. Scrubbing bubbles? Okay, I see fewer hands. Uh, you may not clean your own bathroom. That's fine. Uh, it is a very, very effective bathroom cleaner. Uh, it turns out the bubbles don't have faces on them. You might be disappointed to learn, but they do a great job of cleaning the tub and the shower and so on. If you had to guess, which one of these three products or brands do you think get the most word of mouth? Is it Disney? Is it Cheerios? Or is it Scrubbing Bubbles? What do you think? Okay, I heard a lot of mumbling, so let's take a quick vote. Uh, how many for Disney? I heard a lot for Disney, I think. Okay. I'm going to do a quick straw poll. It looks like around 75% of the room. I'll guess around 75. I heard some people say bubbles. At least a few say bubbles. Okay, good. Looks like another 15, maybe 20% of the room. And Cheerios? Okay, maybe 5 or maybe 10%. I want to point out two things from this little exercise. First, most of you have never been asked this question before. And not just this specific question, because most of you have never been asked this specific question before, but even the more general one of which things get talked about and shared more than others. Right? As I ask this question, it's a big room, I can't see all of you, the lights are dark, but I glanced at a few of your faces, and some of you looked scared. Like you had no idea how to begin to answer this question. What do you mean which one of these gets more word of mouth? I have no idea. And indeed, this particular question is a cheap parlor trick, right? Because one's going to win, two are going to lose, and most of you, maybe all of you, don't represent any of these brands. So you might say, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, which one of these gets more word of mouth doesn't matter. But why one of them gets more to mouth matters a lot. Because if we don't understand why people talk about and share certain things rather than others, if we don't understand influence works, how do we hope to get people to talk about and share our stuff? And that brings me to the second point. If we had to guess, I think the top vote getter was Disney, yes? How many for Disney? Okay, great guess. Unfortunately, it's wrong, but good guess. Uh, I think our runner-up was Scrubbing Bubbles. That makes more sense, right, Bubbles? Also great guess, also wrong. The answer is Cheerios the one that probably 25 of us guessed, right? And so if you guessed it, give yourself a little pat on the back. I'm happy to give you a high five later. But more importantly, I think this points out a gap in our knowledge. There's a lot of hype out there around word of mouth, around social media, around viral marketing. But if we don't understand the science of why people talk, why they share, and how influence works, we're going to spend a lot of time and money and effort and energy in the wrong places. We've got to understand the underlying behavioral science and use it to get people to share our stuff. And so that's a long wit introduction to a title slide. As was nicely mentioned, I'm Professor Jonah Berger. I'm a marketing professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. What I'm going to do today is talk about some of the stuff uh, from my book, Contagious, Why Things Catch On, uh, as well as some stuff uh, from my other book, Invisible Influence, The Hidden Forces That Shape Behavior. Uh, importantly, everything today I'm going to talk about is based on rigorous academic research. We spent the last, oh, you're laughing at the cover. This is actually what the cover looks like, by the way. I'm not like trying to screw with you. This is actually what the cover looks like. It's called a lenticular, depending on the angle you look at it from. Uh, it shows one thing or the other. Indeed, influence is often invisible, which is something we'll talk about today. Uh, but everything I'm going to talk about today is based on academic research. We spent the last 20 years studying this stuff. 
We looked at thousands of pieces of online content, tens of thousands of brands, millions of purchases. And so everything I'm going to talk about is based on research. I'm going to tell a lot of stories, because as we'll talk about today, stories are the currency of conversation. But underneath those stories is a lot, a lot of research. Uh, all the papers, or many of them I'll talk about today, are up on my website. Uh, we won't have time for Q&A today, but feel free to reach out uh, at J1Burger on Twitter. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, after this session. So I want to start with a quote. Uh, and as I mentioned, I teach at the Wharton School. Uh, I teach uh, the, a core course in marketing to about a third of our incoming MBAs. So if you know someone at Wharton, there's about a third chance that they had me. I'm not sure whether that third is a positive or a negative thing, but I'll let you ask them. Uh, but I find when I say something or professors say something, students sometimes take notes. But when a major consulting firm says something, they all put their heads down and they all take notes. So none other than McKinsey uh, pointed out that word of mouth generates more than twice the sales of traditional advertising. And I want to be careful here. By traditional advertising, I don't just mean television ads, radio spots, print campaigns. It's any piece of company-generated communication, any piece of paid or owned media, anything that comes from us rather than a peer. And indeed, there are two key reasons why word of mouth is more impactful. Anyone have any idea what one of those reasons might be? Somebody said trust. Somebody said trust. What, did you, what do you mean by trust? Yeah. Ah, so you're saying, yeah, I don't trust when the company says something. I don't trust ads, right? And many of us don't trust ads. There's only one weird thing, right? We don't trust ads, but somehow we assume our customers trust ads. Like, our customers don't trust the other ads, but when we come on, they're like, ah, it's you guys. I'm going to trust you, right? And uh, I'm going to pick on shampoo ads for a moment because I think they're easy to pick on. Basically, every shampoo ad you've ever seen is the same. There's a man or a woman with short or long flowy hair, and they use the shampoo, and then they get an attractive spouse. <laughs> You've never seen a shampoo ad where someone uses a shampoo, and then they get an ugly spouse, because no one would use that shampoo, right? And basically, every piece of paid media is some version of that shampoo ad, right? You look at vacation destinations, the kids always look like they're having a great time. You look at restaurants, people always look like they're enjoying the food. But the same thing is true in B2B, right? Nobody says, hey, yeah, customer service, Ooh, we're not so good at that, actually. We're, we're in the bottom 10% of our industry, but you know, we're working our way up. We're going to be in the 20%, the bottom 20% next year, and here's some competitors that are doing a better job. Talk to them, but if they're busy, come to us. No, we all say we have great products. We have the best innovation. We have fantastic service, right? But because of that, as your colleague pointed out, the customer doesn't know whether they can trust you or not. But their friends, their colleagues, their peers will tell them straight, hey, I worked with that organization. They were great or I worked with them and they weren't so great, right? Much more likely to trust those friends and peers, right? But trust is only one of the benefits. The second is a little more nuanced, and that's the targeting benefit of word of mouth. How do we find the right potential people that would be good customers or clients, right? And digital has provided a much easier route to target. Now we have a lot more information about the people we're trying to reach, and it's opened up the wealth of opportunities. But it's still not perfect targeting, right? It's really hard to know people as well as their friends or colleagues do, right? And that's really the benefit of word of mouth, right? Because people go through their mental Rolodex, right? Go through their social network like a searchlight. Think about the person or people that'll find information most relevant. An example of this happened to me a couple years ago. I got a book in the mail. Academics often get books from publishers. They send them to us with the hopes that we'll assign them to our students and they'll sell more copies in the process. But this time I didn't get one book. I got two. And it wasn't two copies of the same book. It was two Two copies of different books, sorry. It was two copies of the exact same book. And I remember sitting there going, two copies of the same book, right? Why the second copy? And there was a note in the back of one that said, hey, Professor Berger, we think you'll like this book, but we think you'll also know someone else who will like this book. Pass the second copy on to them. And that's the first very simple hack I'm going to share with you guys this afternoon. How by turning customers or clients into advocates can we get them to do the work for us? Because I didn't give that book out randomly. I pass it on to the person in my network that I thought would find it most interesting or relevant. No wonder that referred business, people that come in from existing business, have about 20% higher customer lifetime value. Because someone said this person would like it and this person wouldn't. Right? People tend to be friends. People tend to be connected with other people like them. If you have clients that are in a certain industry, they tend to know other people in that industry. If you're going after a certain set of consumers, they tend to know other people that are like them. It's called homophily in sociology. And what that means is we can find people and get them to talk about and share our stuff. They'll do the targeting for us, right? 
Your companies probably have a sales department. You may represent the sales department. The question here is how can we turn our customers into the largest and most effective sales team we've ever had, right? And one more just great example of this recently from Uber. They said, hey, having a holiday party, request free rides for your guests here. Now, that's nice of them, but notice it's not just nice. Notice what they're doing. They're saying, hey, existing user, who in your social network might like us? Pass this on to them. They're getting those people to do the work for them. Rather than them having their targeting, they're getting folks to do the work for them. And so the question now is great, word of mouth is valuable, how do we get it? And usually, when we think about things like word of mouth and influence these days, we think online, right? We think about digital influencers who have a large following. We think about social media and building friends and followers on digital channels. If you had to guess from 100% all the way down to zero, what percent of all word of mouth would you guess is online? on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, blogs, online reviews, from 100% all the way down, what number might you guess? 15, 20. I feel like an auctioneer up here. Anyone wanna go higher than 20? Anyone wanna go lower than 15? All 1,800 of us are nicely arrayed right between 15 and 20%. This is really, this is impressive. By the way, what I've noticed doing this a couple times is when someone says 15, if you're sitting there thinking 90, you're like, maybe I'll adjust that number down just a little bit. Maybe I'll make it 80 or 75. Maybe 90 was a little bit aggressive. Yeah, so the answer is around 7 to 10 percent. Around 7 to 10 percent of all word of mouth is online. And I want to put that number in context. Does it mean that online's not important? No. Online is certainly a channel that with word of mouth flows, a way it flows more quickly, right, and more uh, across geographic regions than offline. But it's not the only channel through which word of mouth flows. Most word of mouth is offline, face to face, right? Around the breakfast table, talking to colleagues at lunch, grabbing a beer with a friend after work, right? And the challenge, right, when I uh, work with organizations, I tell them this, they go, wow, why are we investing so much money in social media? And I often say, well, that's a really good question. Because it's not that social media is not a useful channel, but it's not the only channel. I'm not saying don't think online, I'm saying don't think only online. Because online, it's really easy to get enamored with the technology, right? 20, 25 years ago, someone might have gotten up on a stage like this and said, you know what your business needs? MySpace. It's going to change your business forever. Right? 15 years ago, it was Foursquare. Remember location-based social networking? Mm, not as popular as Foursquare was in the past. A couple years ago, it was Vine. Is Vine still around? Mm, not as much as it used to be. It's easy to hop on the technology bandwagon. Harder to think about the psychology, right? Not the technology, the psychology. Why are people talking? Why are they sharing? How does influence work? And how can we use that to get people to share our stuff? And by focusing so much on the technology, right, we tend to think about how many friends or followers we have. But as this cartoon, I think, nicely points out, it's not just about the number of friends and followers we have. I know it's a little morose. It's a funeral, right? And many of us were assuming if we just connected friends and followers, if we just got a lot of connections, we'd be successful. But at the end of the day, it's not how many connections we have, it's are they engaging with our messages, right? Whether online or off, are they talking and sharing? And good news, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why people talk and why they share. As I mentioned, we've looked at thousands of pieces of online content. A few years ago, we did textual analysis of six months of New York Times articles, doing natural language processing to figure out which ones made the most emailed list and why. We've looked at a similar number of videos. We've looked at tens of thousands of brands, millions of purchases across the United States and around the world. Again and again, we see the same six factors come up. I put them in a framework called the STEPS framework that stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories. Each of these is a psychological driver of why people talk and why they share. It's not about a certain vertical. It's not about products versus services. It's not about internal conversations versus external conversations. It's about the psychology of, of talk why we share some things rather than others, and how influence works. I won't have time today to talk about all six, but I'm going to talk about at least the first two. Uh, we'll talk about social currency and triggers, uh, and then as long as there's time, uh, I'll wrap up by talking about stories. And my goal today is give, to give you three, five, maybe even more things you can do tomorrow to get people to talk and share and influence folks, whether those folks are external, turning those customers into advocates, or internal. Right? When I'm trying to build a case for something, when I'm trying to start a new initiative, how can I use the other people within my organization as a way to get that to happen? How can I build a movement to change behavior within the organizations I represent? Before I get to the steps, though, just a couple things very quickly. Uh, first, 
So I'm going to use a mix of examples today of B2B and B2C. Uh, I found that what's fun about B2C examples is they're easier for a broad audience to understand. I find that everyone in B2B industries loves B2B examples, but the only B2B examples that count are in their own industries. If it's another B2B industry, it doesn't count as a right example. So I'm going to use a mix of examples to hopefully hit uh, different industries. But as you see some B2C ones, I want you to remember something. We tend to think about word of mouth as a consumer phenomenon. We think, oh, it's silly kids talking about toys, or people talking about a music artist, or, you know, parents talking about babysitters, but it's not about business people, right? I mean, word of mouth doesn't affect business folks when they make business decisions, right? 91% of new business leads in B2B markets come from guess where? Existing business, right? Word of mouth influence is already driving a lot of your new customer acquisition. All I'm going to show you today is how you can get more of that to happen. Because it's not about B2C or B2B, right? It's not about whether they're consumers or business folks. It's about the underlying psychology that drives behavior, right? People don't put on a different hat when they're at work and at home. The same science drives why people talk and why they share. Once we see the principles, we need to think about how to deploy these principles, right? So if I'm trying to get two people in an industry to talk to one another, I need to think about when are they going to come in contact with one another? When is a channel open between them so information and influence can flow? right? Which is easier with consumers, harder in the B2B markets, but not impossible. And so we'll come back to that idea at the end. Uh, and then one more thing before we get there. I want to talk about the TSA. So many of you in the audience today are probably sitting there going, ah, word of mouth, influence, that's great. But certain things get talked about and others don't, right? I mean, sure, yeah, if I was Tesla, I could get a lot of word of mouth, but certain categories are just difficult to get people to talk about and share. The TSA would be one of those categories, right? How many of you think the TSA is a really exciting brand that does lots of exciting things? Sorry, no, no offense to the TSA. We all, we all pass through the TSA on the way here. We're going to do it on the way home, so we shouldn't say anything negative about them. Uh, guess how many followers the TSA has on Instagram? Five? It's more than five. I'll give you that. Uh, somebody else want to take a guess? Yeah, one million. Around a million. It's like 900,000, 800, 98, uh, something close to a million. A million followers. The TSA has a million followers. How did they get there? Right? They didn't buy followers. They thought about what would be engaging to their audience. If you're the TSA, you might think, oh, I don't have much to work with. But they do actually. Right? They post all sorts of things that people try to sneak through security. <laughs> For example, not just grenades, but grenades dressed up as tuxedos. Sneak those through security. Remember Freddy Krueger? Imagine you had some Freddy Krueger gloves that shot flames out of the end and tried to sneak those through security. Hmm, probably not a very good idea. Or this one, my personal favorite, someone asked them a question. I have this brick. It's got a happy face on it. It has some sentimental value. Can I sneak this through security? Right? Can I bring this along with me? The TSA has figured out how to engage with their audience. If the TSA can do it, you can do it. Right? The TSA can do it, you can do it. And so as we're thinking about these principles today, I want us to remember it's not about certain things work and other things fail. It's about how to use the science to get people to share anything. All right, so enough uh, dumping on the TSA. So is anybody from New York here today? OK, great. So some of you may have been to this place. Uh, for the rest of you, you can check it out the next time in New York. So imagine you're walking around sort of the Lower East Side area of the city. You've done all the touristy stuff. You've walked across the Brooklyn Bridge. You've gone up the Empire State Building. But it's late in the afternoon on a Saturday. Your stomach is rumbling. You've got to get a bite to eat. When you notice a big hot dog-shaped sign out in front of a restaurant with the words, eat me, written on it in what look like mustard, you say, huh, I haven't had a hot dog in a while. Check this place out. So you walk down a flight of stairs into a restaurant called Criff Dogs. It's called Criff Dogs because one of the founders' name is Chris, uh, and they were touring the United States to figure out what kind of hot dogs they should carry in their restaurant. One of the other guys had his mouth full, and he tried to say Chris's name, and it came out as Criff, and so it's called Criff Dogs. They have every hot dog you can imagine, over 20 hot dogs, depending on when you go in there. They have a good morning hot dog with bacon, eggs, and cheese. I don't know if you want to eat a hot dog for breakfast, but interesting nonetheless. They have a hot dog with green onion and pineapple, and a traditional New York-style water dog with just ketchup and mustard. So you're sitting there, you're munching on your hot dog, and you notice something unusual in the corner of the screen. It almost looks like a phone booth, like one of those things that Clark Kent might jump into to change into Superman. Well, just for fun, you got a minute, slide open that door and walk inside. It's pretty cramped in there. It's a phone booth after all, but on the wall, You'll see something you probably haven't seen in 20, maybe 30 years. Do you remember rotary dial phones? 
Yeah? Remember those phones at your parents or your grandparents' house? You could stick your finger in and go around a circle. That's actually right inside that phone. Just stick your finger, say the number three, go around in a circle, and hold the receiver up to your ear. Well, the phone will actually ring. It'll go ring, ring. Then someone will ask you, pick up the other line, and they'll ask you whether you have a reservation. Now, the first time I heard this story, I said, reservation? I'm in a phone booth inside of a hot dog restaurant. What could I possibly have a reservation for? But if you're lucky, and they happen to have space, or a friend of yours happened to make a reservation, back of that phone booth will open. And you'll be led into a secret bar called Please Don't Tell. <laughs> now, Please Don't Tell has violated a number of traditional laws of marketing. No sign on the street, no sign inside the restaurant. They've done everything they can to make themselves difficult to find. And yet, every day they're full. 3 p.m., phone lines open up. By 3.30, all the seats are gone. You have to hit redial again and again and again, trying to get through. I got it on like a Tuesday night at around 7.30. Not the most popular time. And it's not lack of competition. For those of you who haven't been to New York recently, there's more than one bar in New York City. <laughs> Turns out there's actually a couple on that side of the street, a couple more on the other side of the street, just like you, very competitive industry. So how'd they cut through the clutter? Well, they did something really interesting. They made themselves a secret. And let me tell you a little secret about secrets. Think about the last time someone told you something, and they told you not to tell anybody else. What's the first thing you then did with that information? You told somebody. Because having access to information that not everyone else does makes you look smart and makes you look in the know. It gives you what I'll call social currency. Just like the car we drive and just like the clothes we wear, the things we talk about and the things we share affect how other people see us. And so one way to get people to talk about and share our stuff, to spread our influence, is to make them look good. Right? Too often as marketers, we think about how do we look. How does the product page look? How does our brochure look? How does our sales funnel look? Are we thinking about the right way to pitch people? But we think a lot less about how they look when they talk about us. Because the better we make them look, the more likely they'll be to talk about us and carry us along for the ride. So to explain this idea, I want you to introduce you to a friend of mine. Her name is Carla, and this is a picture of her car. And I want to see how much you can guess about her based on this one piece of information. If you had to guess, for example, how old might you guess that Carla is? How many of you would say between 32 and 48? Almost everybody. Okay, she have kids? Yeah, they play sports? Yeah, what sport do they play? Soccer. There we go. It's like ripple across the room, soccer. It's like a chorus, right? Uh, do you know Carla? I know. But you made these inferences because choices communicate information. Right, car we drive, also the clothes we wear. I thought a lot about what to wear to come see you guys today. Sometimes I get up on a stage like this, and if I'm not wearing a jacket, someone in the audience will go, oh, he looks like he's 25 years old. So I wear a jacket to encourage you to think I'm at least 35 and have my own credit card and can buy my own clothes. Because if I came in here today wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you probably wouldn't take me seriously, right? What we wear, what we drive is a signal of who we are. Well, guess what? Same with what we talk about and same with what we share. Talk a lot about restaurants, people assume you're a foodie. Talk a lot about sports, people assume you know a lot about that. What we share is a signal of who we are. Ever look online and notice that most posts are positive? Hey, look at me, I'm on vacation. Hey, look at me, I met a celebrity. Hey, look at me, I'm traveling in first class. There's so much room for my feet. <laughs> right? But you don't as often see someone going, hey, look at me, I'm at the office. Working on Excel spreadsheet. Check out column C. Last time I checked, I, and I think most of us, spend a lot more time looking at Excel sheet column C than we do in first class. <laughs> Yet if we get upgraded to first class, I bet we'd share it and we would never share Excel sheet column C. Why? Because it wouldn't make us look very good. People select and choose among the things that happen to them to share the ones that make them look good and avoid sharing the ones that make them look bad. Everybody does it. You do it, your friends do it, your customers do it, your employees do it. How can we take advantage of that fact? Well, one way is how can we make people feel like insiders? How can we make them look smart, special, in the know, like they're not like everybody else? Right? Please don't tell they're a great job of that. A bar hidden inside a hot dog restaurant. I see many of you taking notes, which is great. Nothing makes me happier than seeing people take notes. But I'm sure some of you weren't taking notes 
but you wrote down the name of that bar. That's the only thing you're going to write down today in our time together, right? Because you know it'll make you look good to your friends and colleagues to know a place that's cool in New York City, right? The better something makes us look, the more likely we are to talk about and share it. Let me give you a couple more examples of this. So did a project with LinkedIn a few years ago where they wanted help uh, growing their brand. They wanted people to engage with the site more often. So we put together a campaign where we sent emails out to many of their users saying, hey, you have one of the influential profiles on the website. Top 1% or 5% of all profiles. Now people who got that email felt really good, but they didn't just feel good. Guess what else they did? They shared it. Because status is only good if other people know that you have it. Right? You ever go to like a frequent flyer lounge, you're waiting for a plane to take off, and you hear people talking about their frequent flyer status, I'm gold this, I'm platinum that, I'm double ruby diamond, whatever it is. The, the airport lounge in Rome Fiumicino no longer has the hummus that I love. Right? <laughs> what is that person saying? They're saying, I'm busy, I'm important, I travel a lot. But no one wants to be friends with someone that would literally say, I'm busy, I'm important, I travel a lot. So people have to figure out a way to brag without seeming like they're bragging. Under bragging, humble bragging, ways to communicate desired information without seeming like someone that you wouldn't want to be friends with. Well, they use brands, they use companies to do that, right? Lisa doesn't care, right, about LinkedIn. She cares about how she looks to her peers. But she shares this because it makes her look good and LinkedIn comes along for the ride, right? You're talking about your Delta frequent flyer status. You don't care about Delta. You care about looking good, but Delta's part of that conversation. If you ever seen American Express black card, and maybe you know someone who has one, they pull it out at every opportunity. <laughs> if they made a necklace that you could buy to put the American Express black card on, they would buy that necklace, right? Because status is only good if other people know that you have it. And so the question then is how can we give people status? How can we give them a way to look good to their peers and talk about us as a way to get it? One more example of this, uh, completely different domain, but a number of years ago, Beyonce came out with a new album, no advertising. She just put it online because she knew people would want to be the first one in their social network to tell everyone else. Because if you know something before everyone else, you look smart and in the know, right? If you ever look on YouTube, you ever notice what the first comment on most YouTube videos says? First, it doesn't say, I like the video, I hate the video, it says first, I got there before everybody else. How can we make people feel smart, feel special, feel in the know? Right? If we're having a webinar, not, don't make it an open access. Everybody's invited. Say, hey, you're my best 10 clients. You can bring one person with you because you're such a valued client. Making that person feel special, and they bring someone in that's more likely to be a future client. Client advisory boards are a great example of this. People feel honored to be included, but they're really an opportunity to give you feedback on what you're doing and how you could do it more effectively. But because they feel honored, they're more likely to talk and more likely to share. Let me give you one more example of social currency. This is called finding the unremarkability. And I think this is really key. Remarkability is a great word. It means worthy of remark. Something is surprising, something is novel, something is interesting. And some of you are probably sitting there going, okay, great, this is, this is fine, but I couldn't use this, right? I mean, I, what, I, what I do, this wouldn't work for what I do. We have a notion that certain things are naturally remarkable and others are doomed to fail, right? Well, I wanna show you that's not necessarily the case. Yes, certain products might seem less remarkable, Right? B2B software, logistics management services, uh, dishwashers, blenders, socks, toilet paper. Let me show you an oldie but goodie how a company got over 200 million views for one of the least exciting things we can think of, and that is a blender. Here we go. Will it blend? That is the question. I love my new iPhone. It does everything. But will it blend? That is the question. Let's find out. I think I'm going to push the smoothie button. <laughs> I smoke. Don't breathe this. <laughs> mm. 
Now, you fans on YouTube have asked me to blend an iPhone, so I did. But I have another. So I won't ask for a show of hands, but as the number of people had their mouth agape the entire time, I'm guessing that at least a few of you found this somewhat remarkable, right? This video has over 15 million views. The set, they do it for a variety of different things, has over 200 million. Blender sales go up over 700% when these videos come out. Now, anyone in the audience would be happy with a 700% sales increase. That's not the most remarkable thing about this to me. They did this for one of the least exciting things we can think of, right? A blender. Right? They did it for a $50 marketing budget. You laughed at that poor guy. He's not an, uh, not an actor. He's actually the CEO of the company. Right? That's why he's a little goofy. Uh, they hired a marketing guy, came into the office, noticed a pile of sawdust on the floor. He said, hey, his colleague, what's with the sawdust? Are we expanding the company? His colleague goes, no. CEO is doing what he does every day, which is try to break blenders. So the CEO would take two by four pieces of wood and golf balls and big lighters, whatever he could find, chuck it in the blender to see if the blender was tough enough to cut it. Marketing person thought this was genius, filmed his CEO doing what he's already doing, gave him the white lab coat and the glasses, the rest is history. $15 marketing budget, huge return on investment. Still not the most remarkable thing about this to me. The most remarkable thing about this to me is that they did this for one of the least exciting things we can think of. Any of you are sitting there going, I can't use this idea, I want you to remember the blender. Nothing is less exciting than a blender. Maybe it's at TSA, but barely anything is less exciting than a blender. Right? Because they didn't just tell people what was remarkable about their offering, they showed people. They showed rather than told. Notice what they didn't do. They didn't stand up there and say, hey, we make a really powerful blender. They showed people. Right? How can we show rather than tell? And I'll come back to this at the end when I talk about stories. Just one more example uh, of this, I think, here as well. Right? 3M has done a nice job of this, too. They make this thing called uh, Novec, which is essentially uh, a cleaner uh, and a, uh, a, um, a thing that cools uh, electronic parts. They want to show people how effective it is. They can tell you, but how could they show you? Well, they build a vat of it and put a computer monitor in it. They encourage you to dip your phone in the vat. A couple years ago at South by Southwest, they had this great demonstration. It shows rather than tells. Anyone can say their stuff won't corrode electronic parts. This shows it won't corrode electronic parts. How can we show rather, uh, rather than tell? Okay, uh, next I want to talk about triggers. Uh, and to do this, I want to use an example that many of you are probably quite familiar with. Uh, how many of you have seen Geico's ad for Hump Day? Okay, at least a few of you. Do the rest of you know what hump day is? Generally, Monday's the beginning of the week, Friday's the end of the week, Wednesday's the hump, you have to get over to get to Friday. So insurance company Geico builds a piece of content based on this, right? Uh, there's an annoying camel walking around an office going, what day is it today, what day is it, what day is it? Everyone ignores him, he's a very annoying camel. Uh, finally comes across this poor woman and she goes, it's hump day. And the camel goes, woo woo. Uh, and the ad goes, how happy are people who save money with Geico? Happier than a camel on hump day. Get it? Camels, humps, hump day. You're supposed to chuckle when I make a joke. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So thank goodness it is funnier when you see it on television, right? If it was this bad, they wouldn't show it on television. It is funnier. But for those of you who've seen it, it's not that funny. Yet this is the second most shared ad of a couple years ago. Not a beer ad, not a car ad, but an insurance ad. And so one question is, well, why? Why did so many people share an ad about insurance? Well, I'm a data guy, dug a little deeper. This is what the share data looks like over time. Spike in shares, then it goes down. Then another spike, then it goes down. Then another spike, then it goes down. If you look closer, spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart. And if you get even closer, you'll notice that they're every Wednesday, or as it's colloquially known, hump day, right? This piece of content is equally good or bad every day of the week. But Wednesday rolls around, provides a ready reminder what a psychologist would call a trigger to make people think about it and talk about it and share it. Because if something's top of mind, it's much more likely to be tip of tongue. Right? Too often we think if people like, about it, like us, they'll talk about us. Right? If we pitch an initiative internally and people like it, they'll talk about it. If a customer likes us, they'll talk about us externally. But the problem is people like a whole bunch of things that they never talk about because they never think about them. 70% of purchase, 70% of action is consideration. Are you thinking about it near at the moment where that action takes place? There's a restaurant or whatever city you live in that you love going to, but if you never think about it when you're going out to dinner, you'll never go there. Right? They did a study in the grocery store a number of years ago where they changed the music that played over the PA system. So imagine you're wheeling your grocery cart through the aisles. Someday they play French music, and some days they play German music. What'd they find? 
On days they played French music, sales of French wine went up. And on days they played German music, sales of German wine and beer went up. Did the music change what wine people liked? No, they still liked whatever wine they liked. All it did was remind them to purchase it. Top of mind, more likely to be tip of tongue, more likely to take action. So let's spend a couple minutes uh, on this idea. Here's a little more data. This is word of mouth about Cheerios about, uh, by time of day. What do you notice about when people talk about Cheerios? Morning, right? Not rocket science. Notice how the, uh, it shifted to the right on the weekend. Any idea why? Sleep in. Sleep in. One reason people talk about a product or a service or an idea is they just used that product or service or idea, right? If you just ate Cheerios, it's top of mind, you're more likely to talk about it. If your client just got finished using your product or service, you're top of mind, they're more likely to think of you. But what happens the rest of the time? For us who have products and services that are not used as frequently, or products or services even when we use them, we don't think about, right? Notice Cheerios doesn't keep getting talked about the rest of the day because other things come top of mind. I hope you're listening to the talk right now. I hope you're thinking about it. It's top of mind. But as soon as you get out of here, you're going to be thinking about drinks and dinner and everything else you're doing tonight. Other things replace it as top of mind. So how can we stay top of mind? How can we find additional triggers to make people think about us, our product, our service, or idea, or something we want people to do? Right? Internally within our organizations, we want to change behavior. How can we trigger people so that they take the desired action at the right point in time? Well, good news, there are other triggers. If I said peanut butter and, what word might come to mind? Jelly. If I said rum and, you might think of Coke. Notice that peanut butter, it's almost like a little advertisement for jelly. It's almost like jelly should pay peanut butter like a kickback or like a referral fee every time peanut butter's around because if peanut butter's around, jelly doesn't have to remind you it exists. Peanut butter does all the work for jelly. That's why they have that old slogan, weekends are made for Michelob. They wanted people to think about the beer when the weekend rolls around. Corona's done the same thing with the beach. I challenge you to go on a beach vacation and never think about Corona. It's pretty much impossible, right? If you can go on a beach vacation, never think about Corona, send me an email, I will send you a free beer of your choice, right? Because you're lying there in the sand, you got your sunscreen on, you're reading your book, you get thirsty, you may not like beer, you may not drink Corona, but I guarantee Corona will come to mind. And when you think about it, what is always having it? A lime. Is that random? Is that luck? Is that chance? No, the beach is Corona's trigger, or said very simply, the beach is Corona's peanut butter. And so I would ask you to think about at this point is, okay, great, what's your peanut butter? What's the thing in the environment that will remind people of you even when you're not around? Because you can call them and email them and remind them how great you are, which as your colleague pointed out, they probably won't listen to, or you can link yourself to a peanut butter, and every time they see that peanut butter, they'll think of your jelly, right? Kit Kat did this a few years ago. Sales were down by about 30%. People liked the brand, but they weren't buying it. So they linked themselves to coffee. Having a coffee break, have a Kit Kat. Think about coffee, think about Kit Kat. Coffee and Kit Kat, Kit Kat and coffee, best friends forever. If you're Kit Kat, why is coffee a really good trigger or really good peanut butter to link yourself to? Why coffee? Well, lots of people drink it and they drink it frequently. More frequent triggers are better than less frequent triggers. Weekends are made for Michelob was originally holidays are made for Michelob. But they moved it to the weekend because the weekend is more frequent. But it's not just about frequency. My favorite example of triggers is something that many of us have, which is reusable grocery bags. How many of you have reusable grocery bags somewhere in your home? You have to be like a bad person not to have a reusable grocery bag, right? We all have reusable grocery bags in our home. How many of you use them every time you go to the grocery store? Yeah. It's like you 18 to 20 people are clearly better than the rest of us. <laughs> For the rest of us, why do we forget our bags? Or alternatively, when do we remember them? At the store. Which last time I checked, is kind of too late. <laughs> We've done all our shopping, we feel really good, we got some things on sale, we get to the front of the line, we go, oh, I forgot my bags. You're not going to go back home to get your bags to come back to the store. There's a peanut butter there, but it's in the wrong place. It's like someone thinking about you right after they signed a contract to work with your competitor, right? We don't just need to come to mind frequently, we have to come to mind at the right time. And so as we think about triggers, there are four key questions we need to answer. Four key things we need to think about. First, who do we want to be triggered? This is easy, traditional targeting segmentation, right? Traditional marketing 101, who are the people we want to think about us? But then most importantly, when do we want them to think about us? 
What is the right time? What is the right thing that's come up? When do we want us to come to mind? What is in the environment at that time? And how create a link to that thing? Those four questions, the who, the when, the what, and the how, make sure we come to mind right before action. We don't need to come to mind all the time. We just need to come to mind right before someone's making a decision in which they might want to choose us. Let me give you an example of this. A few years ago, we did a study, uh, not up the road, but a little bit up the road at Stanford University. I did my PhD there, uh, and we wanted to convince undergraduates to eat more fruits and vegetables. So over a two-week period, we measured fruit and vegetable consumption, and halfway between, we gave them a slogan. And we gave them one of two slogans. Some people got the slogan, live the healthy way, eat five fruits and veggies a day. And other people got the slogan, each and every dining hall tray needs five fruits and veggies a day. And we did what many of us do in marketing, right? We tested these slogans. Before the campaign ran, we said, hey, how much do you like this slogan? And how likely do you think it will be to change behavior? The quick answer is people loved the first slogan and hated the second one. They thought the first one was clever and would definitely change their behavior. They thought the second one was not so good and a little bit clunky. Indeed, on a 10-point scale, it was around a 2. You have to work hard to get a 2 on a 10-point scale, right? They really didn't like this slogan. Uh, but we gave it to people anyway, right? Usually, if we add test loops, we only run the first slogan because it performs so much better. But we thought we'll run both just in case. We found something interesting. We looked at the data, pre and post, before the campaign and after, right? That slogan, live the healthy way, eat five fruits, use the veggies a day. People loved it, thought it was really clever, would definitely change behavior. We analyzed the data, no change in behavior. Great slogan, sounded really good, no effect on action. Second slogan didn't do so well, right? Didn't test very well, but when we analyze the data pre versus post, 25% increase in fruit and vegetable consumption. Why did the second slogan work? Well, if someone could hit the back button very quickly, two slides, just the last one with the four things on it. One more, thank you. Exactly this. Who do we want to be triggered? Undergraduates at Stanford University. When do we want them to think about us? Well, we want them to eat fruits and vegetables, so we should probably get them to be triggered right before that behavior takes place, which is in their dining hall. What's around them at that time? Well, trays, because a lot of them eat in dining halls with trays. How create a link to that thing? This ridiculous slogan that we came up with ourselves. right? We follow these four key steps to change behavior. It's not just about word of mouth. Anytime we're trying to change behavior, increase our influence, it's not just whether people like something, it's whether they're thinking about it or not. How can we make the problem we solve our trigger? How can we make our peanut butter, when the problem comes up, people think about us? Right, top of mind, more likely to be tip of tongue, more likely to drive action. Okay, uh, I don't have time today to talk about emotion. The idea here is when we care, we share. Uh, not all emotions drive sharing, though. Some positive emotions actually decrease sharing, and some negative emotions increase sharing. I'll stick around after, happy to answer questions about this, or you can check it out uh, in the book or online. Uh, I won't talk about public. Uh, here, the idea is easy to see, easy to imitate. The simple version is you can copy someone's shirt, but you can't copy their socks because they're hard to see. So how can we make things more visible? Uh, I'll give you one example of practical value, and then I'll wrap up uh, by talking about stories. Practical value is all about useful information, news you can use. In addition to being content marketing, right, how can we create content that's useful, it also impacts how we frame numerical information. Right? Because framing numbers can make them seem larger or smaller. Imagine you sell something that's $20, and I know not all of you do, but imagine for a moment that you do, uh, and it, you could make it $5 off to motivate action. What would $5 off $20 be in percentage terms? I know you were promised there would be no math today. It's very light math. You can do it. Everyone agree that it's 25%? Yes. Economically the same to the customer? Yes. Equally likely to drive behavior? No. Right? 25% off is actually more motivating than $5 off. Even though they're the same in economic terms, one is more likely to change behavior than the other. In fact, you could even make that 24 or 23% and it would be more motivating to change behavior. Interesting. You might say, well, maybe percentages off are more motivating. Well, hold on. Take some, it's $2,000. There, make it $500 off or 25% off. There, it's the exact opposite. $500 off is more motivating. It's something I call the rule of 100. Numbers are not just numbers. How we frame those numbers makes them seem larger or smaller and can drive people to action, right? Anytime we convey numerical information, we shouldn't just assume it's numbers, right? We shape how people see those numbers. We did a great study uh, just a year ago where we instituted this at an online retailer, right? All they did was change their discounting. They got a 1% to 2% lift in sales just by changing how they use discounts. Didn't cost them any money, right, but using...